Geeks, you might not know this about me, but sometimes I like to pour myself some wine and enjoy a little high art cinema. And recently I had the pleasure of seeing a giant monkey punch a lizard and was reminded of the good old days when I was a kid watching Godzilla... Oh, hold on one second, friends. Matt Frank? Hey, Phil. I, I heard you were talking about Godzilla. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. You heard me? All the way from Austin, Texas, here in Canada. That's right. Well, I suppose that makes sense. Well, since you're already here, what do you say we talk about the Godzilla cartoon? I mean, between the two of us, you actually have an entry in Wikizilla. The show is about Godzilla and his nephew, Godzuki. Uh, it's a Hanna-Barbera joint from... Hold up, hold up, hold the phone. His nephew? Yeah, are we are we not doing a video about the Hanna-Barbera Godzilla from 1978? Mm, not exactly, Matt. As much as I'd love to, we are here to talk about Godzilla the series. In the 1990s, Sony Entertainment started an animation division to adapt some of Columbia TriStar's motion pictures and other properties into animated shows. This division successfully turned out cartoons based on such recognizable properties as Ghostbusters, Men in Black, and later Jackie Chan Adventures. When it was learned that Sony had picked up the rights to Godzilla, it was a natural transition to adapt it into a series. And funny enough, the plans to go ahead with the cartoon were finalized eight months before the movie actually came out. However, unlike some production companies that own networks or cable stations, Sony had to go out and sell the idea of a Godzilla series before production could actually begin. The series would be developed by Jeff Klein and Richard Rainus. Klein worked with Emmerich and Devlin to devise the series Bible and had initial monster designs drawn up in order to try and sell it to a network. And luckily, Fox agreed to buy 40 episodes of the series for their Saturday morning Fox Kids lineup. The advance purchase was a great advantage for Sony since 40 was the magic number needed to later sell a series as a daily strip to syndication. This allowed Sony to budget costs and expenses over the 40 episodes up front, and not have to do half the episodes at one time, and then hope the other half will be approved later. Now at this point, Godzilla and his new appearance were closely guarded secrets. Although Jeff and his crew had access to the Godzilla designs and information about the movie, everyone working on the cartoon had to sign non-disclosure agreements and were sworn to absolute secrecy. Early on in the development, some of the people working on the show were not even allowed to see the Godzilla design. According to producer-slash-head director Audu Payden, very basic shapes were used to approximate Godzilla in the early storyboards and designs. Later, after the OK was given for the design to be released to the crew, the actual Godzilla would be drawn in. At one point, someone had even drawn an episode with a sock puppet to represent Godzilla. I mean, complete with button eyes and all. And I am no stranger to working with sock puppets. Weirdly enough, neither am I. Until the release of the movie, Klein and Payton had worked closely and secretly with lead character designer Phil Barlow to design the look and adapt the movie Godzilla into animated form through a series of seven drawings. Each night, these drawings had to be collected and locked away as they had certain features, jaw designs, etc. that would give outsiders clues to the new Godzilla's appearance. Even more so, the series was produced under the name Heat Seekers, just like the team's boat in the show. To complete the illusion, the show's creators even created phony concept art of fire-based superheroes with a sheepdog made out of pure fire named Flamer. When people would call and ask if Sony Pictures Family Entertainment, or Spiffy, was working on Godzilla, the stock reply would be that they were doing it over in France. The ruse worked so well that misinformation was soon leaked out to trade papers via a reporter that thought he had the buzz, or the scoop about a new series called Heat Seekers. Little did he know that if he had the title correct, it would have been an even bigger scoop. Originally, it was thought that there would be a more defined and stronger intercommunication between Nick and Godzilla. So some things were designed in the development phase that never made it into the show. 
These included devices that made it possible to ride on Godzilla's back and steer him using special eyeglasses. The eyeglasses did eventually turn up with a new purpose in an episode called Vision, in which Godzilla confronts giant mutated hummingbirds. The flying monsters move so fast that they cannot be seen, so Godzilla is fitted with special goggles to track them. In early sketches of the characters, an attempt was made to have them look more like their movie counterparts. These would later evolve into designs that emphasize the character and personality rather than a literal translation of any of the actors. This, of course, allowed the crew to express their creativity and to avoid paying actors to use their likeness. The production decided they didn't need to bring back as many established characters that would only serve to clutter the cast. That's not to say several didn't make occasional appearances, including Audrey and her cameraman, Victor Animal Pilati, Philippe, who assigned Monique to the team and popped up from time to time to provide them with valuable information, and even Anthony Hicks also makes a few appearances, but now as a demoted Colonel Hicks instead of Major. He initially believes the offspring to be just another murderous monster like his father, but he eventually comes to recognize that the new Godzilla is a necessary evil in the ongoing battle against other mutants. One of the newer characters added to the show was French Vietnamese secret agent Monique Dupre. Klein stated, we felt it would be nice if we could have a female kick-ass character because the women in the movie weren't quite that. Another original character created for the animated series was Randy Hernandez, half black, half Portuguese, all attitude. He was added to appeal to the teenagers and younger viewers by giving them someone to identify with. He also happens to be the group's hacker man. His computer skills allow him to tap into anything, whether securing airplane tickets, fixing a parking violation, raiding a villain's computer files, regaining control over a robot monster, or breaking into enemy compounds. Randy even sees Godzilla, or the G-Man as he calls him, as the biggest, baddest, coolest creature on the planet. He regards the monster with the respect born of fear with just a touch of religious awe. So you could say he's pretty much Matt Frank. And who can forget Mendel Craven, the ultimate hypochondriac? He is allergic to simply everything, especially danger. Originally, the network had wanted an animal in the cast. Fox's very own Haim Saban had actually wanted to have the Taco Bell Chihuahua in the series due to the popularity of the commercials pairing the dog with Godzilla. However, it was thought that trying to show the gargantuan Godzilla and the tiny dog in one shot would be an animator's nightmare and the idea was soon dropped. But they did get a robot, Nigel. Built by Mendel Craven, Nigel is a research robot whose name is an anagram for Next Millennium Intelligence Gathering Electronic Liaison. You see, Nigel travels where Heat Team cannot. The ocean floors, inside an active volcano, or near highly toxic fumes which usually results in the robot getting pummeled, bashed up, or obliterated. The script for the first episode had him getting killed as part of the story. Everyone working on the show liked this, and it caught on as an in-joke in almost every episode. And as Jeff puts it, it definitely became an homage to Kenny, no doubt about it. Nigel is destroyed in every episode of the series. Almost. But in the few episodes in which he does survive are more than compensated in the episode Ring of Fire, where he gets destroyed not once, not twice, but three times. New characters included recurring villain Cameron Winter, an old college rival of Nick's, Maximilian Spiel, a billionaire who sought to make a profit from monster fights, and redneck hunters Dale, Hank, and Bill looking to bag themselves a Godzilla. Since the writers wouldn't get to see any of the episodes as they were writing their scripts, the story editors were in charge of infusing their scripts with characteristics featured in the show and maintaining continuity. The series employed a mixture of writers who had worked on previous Sony series, as well as comic book professionals who were used to tight deadlines and telling a story with limited space. Among the series writers were Len Wein, Marv Wolfman, and Mark Hoffmeyer, who also worked on Spider-Man the Animated Series. Which is a perfect segue to remind you that we did an episode on it. Most of the monster scenes are shot from ground level. The camera rarely pans out, making the kaiju appear larger and, as a result, more terrifying. Richard's directive to me as I designed the main title sequence and directed my episodes was to keep the camera at human level as often as possible. In other words, don't automatically fly through the ceiling every time a huge monster appears because it would immediately cancel out the realism. 
Instantly, I knew why the older films weren't holding up anymore. The cameras were almost always placed at monster level while filming the monsters, and human level while filming the humans. Had the filmmakers picked one or the other and stuck with it throughout, it would have been a very different experience. As flawed as the Sony Godzilla may have been in its story, I had to admit the images were riveting. And it was precisely because the cinematography followed this philosophy. I was glad later to see Toho picked up on this and applied it to the original Godzilla. It helped me immensely to restore my respect and it made it possible for me to be entertained again. The backgrounds used on the show were a heavily involved process. Rather than being painted on a white background like most shows were at the time, they were painted on animation cells in sections and layered over each other. It created the distinct look prominent in Sony cartoons at the time. Originally, Jason Priestley was cast to replace Matthew Broderick as Dr. Nick Totopoulos. In fact, he recorded five full episodes when it became apparent that his schedule would not allow him to keep reprising the role. Therefore, Ian Ziering was cast. Ian Ziering? Why does that name sound familiar? Ian would eventually go on to star in another disaster franchise, Sharknado. The series attracted a number of notable guest stars. Among them being Linda Blair as monster rights activist Alexandra Springer, Hellboy star Ron Perlman as one of the Leviathan aliens, and Roddy McDowell as Dr. Hugh Trevor in what would be his final role before his untimely death from cancer a mere three weeks later. Jeff Klein explained the reason why they were able to get well-known actors to provide voices for cartoons. One of the nice surprises in working in kids' TV, you can get almost anybody to come in and do a voice. For actors, if you are the lead in a sitcom or a well-known actor, there is a lot of pressure on you to carry a scene. You have to look perfect and be perfect. But with these roles, it's like being in a radio play. You're in a room for three or four hours with a bunch of other people. You can wear whatever you want. The fact that you're doing a guest spot for us is less important than the guy sitting to your left who can do 17 different alien voices is. So I think it is actually a kick for them. The plan was simple. The movie comes out in the summer. The cartoon premieres in the fall. By winter, the movie will be available on video, and then the second half of the first season returns on TV. Since Godzilla the series was started before the movie even came out, when the movie did come out, the staff was able to watch as the box office numbers came in. Now critically, it was abysmal. Roger Ebert even described it as a big, ugly, ungainly device to give teenagers the impression they are seeing a movie. I mean, for me personally, as a nine-year-old kid when it came out, I loved it. But looking back now, boy, oh boy. But what did you think of it, Matt? Well, here's the thing. I have really complicated opinions on the movie because, you know, when it came out and I was a little kid and I liked it, but, you know, I, I knew something was wrong. I knew it felt off. It felt wrong. And it's not made with any love or appreciation of the original film. Now, I've often maintained that you don't have to be a fan of something in order to make a new adaptation of it, but I still feel like you should at least care about what you're doing and know what you're doing and not just be completely dismissive of 40 years worth of history. You don't even necessarily have to have it where monsters... Now, despite Matt's rant, the movie was a box office success, but it had performed under studio's expectations, so the rest of the trilogy was canceled. That's right, the studio hoped this to be the start of a trilogy. But after running the numbers and the fact that they would still have to pay more to license the IP from Toho, it didn't make sense. So while it wasn't a dud, it still wasn't close to the numbers of Roland's previous films. And it did sell a lot of merchandise. So with all that said, they moved to Phase 2 of the Godzilla Cinematic Universe. And on September 12th of 1998, Godzilla the series premiered on Fox Kids. Here's the secret behind Smash Burgers. You can't use the spatula with the holes on the top. You have to use a flat spatula and use another implement to flatten it. That's how you're going to get the crispy edges. Because I, one thing I hate, it's burgers that are too thick. The premiere episode picks up directly from where the movie left off, so everything lines up perfectly to achieve the brand synergy. Just when the first Godzilla is destroyed, another one is born. The baby imprinted on Nick... So rather than destroying the new Godzilla, Nick resolves to study it, and a bond soon grows between the two. He recruits snarky behavioral expert Elise Chapman, engineer, chemist, and coward Mendel Craven, intern and hacker Randy Hernandez, 
Robot Nigel. And mysterious, sexy, and extremely dangerous agent Monique Dupre from SDECE. Together, they form Humanitarian Environmental Analysis Team. Or HEAT, if you prefer. And so begins his study of and battle with giant mutations that rear their ugly heads from week to week. The first two episodes do an excellent job of laying the foundation for the show. All of the main characters and their relationships are established. The show found a good balance between portraying Godzilla as a creature driven purely by instinct and some kind of ancient protector of the planet. Sure, Zilla Jr. does act a lot like a wild animal defending its turf in New York, but it doesn't randomly attack humans. Instead, it forms bonds with humanity and tries to exist with our inferior species in a kind of balance. But the show is entitled Nick and Friends. The show is called Godzilla. The star of the show is the titular 180-foot-tall pet monster. Godzilla is regularly shown to help humans, mostly in the form of saving them from falling to their deaths. Godzilla is swift, intelligent, and above all, uncontrollably ferocious. Make no mistake, he is a monster, and he views the entire planet as his territory. As a result, Godzilla will abide no threat to the world, whether said threat comes from another giant-sized monstrosity, or from a scientist hatching some mad scheme, or from exactly three rednecks. Voiced by Frank Welker, by the way. I bet I could do it if I tried. Well, let's hear it. Give me your best shot. <gasps> what do you think? Eh, don't quit your day job. The series pits Godzilla against a number of mutated freaks over the course of its two seasons. For example... The episode on Early Frost squares Godzilla against a creature that can mask itself much like a chameleon. Another fun episode is What a Long Strange Trip It's Been, where the team literally has to travel inside Godzilla to save him. Now, the show was still primarily aimed at younger viewers, so it never really contained any real gore, but it did try to push the envelope every now and then. Bodies melting away, being reshaped by outside forces, even being resurrected as horrific parodies of their former selves. I mean, some are really gruesome. Take, for example, Medusa, a giant sea anemone that can drain the fluid from her victims. And most notably, the original Godzilla gets brought back by alien invaders by being outfitted with some robot parts to replace its decayed body. Yes, you heard that right. Zombie alien cyborg Godzilla. That's just a poor man's mecha Godzilla, and you know it. Admittedly, yes. You see, the tight production schedule and the fact that it would be almost impossible to adapt one of the Toho monsters into animated form, send it to Toho for approval, and get it back in time to include in an episode forced the series to slightly repackage them. Another example is the giant cicada and its multi-stage life cycle. This is a clear homage to Mothra, but with around 60 monsters, I'm sure you enjoyed some of them. I really like the Dragmas that are these monsters from the future that are genetically engineered to be these new apex predators. I really like their designs. The real standout monsters are, of course, King Cobra and the Robo Yeti. Uh, those guys are really fun because they complement each other in that episode. And, uh, of course, there's the giant clone of Godzilla, the Chameleon. That thing is horrifying, and I love it. And I actually do like the giant hummingbirds. I think they're creative and fun. They eat jet fuel. That's just such a fun idea. And not all monsters on the show were evil. At times, they were just misunderstood creatures protecting their turf or looking for their children. And Godzilla even gets a girlfriend. But outside of that, the show went above and beyond to flesh out its characters and world. Cat and Mouse opens with a quick shot of cement mixers working to fill in one of Godzilla's footprints in the middle of a New York City street providing a rare example of the aftermath of a kaiju rampage. There is also a scene at the beginning of the episode, The Ballad of Jeanne du Marais, where Heat cleans up residue from an unseen. It's a nice bit that actually shows that the group does have to take responsibility for the results of their actions. The show wasn't afraid to get experimental at times, too. The episode's scale was told entirely through the perspective of cameras. Every shot in the episode is either from Animal's news camera or the security cams on Monster Island, and occasionally Nigel, before he gets destroyed. Again. All in all, the series was closer to those representations, with Godzilla fighting other giant monsters and the use of his atomic breath. 
Funny enough, the show aired around the same time as Kong the Animated Series, only fueling the rivalry between the two titans. Ah, but you forget, Phil, that Kong might be a king, but he is no god, and nothing can bring him down. Well... In early 1999, Trendmasters announced that they would be releasing a line of Godzilla the Series toys that fall to coincide with the series' second season premiere. In fact, Trendmasters began work on their Godzilla the Series line while the animated show was still in the early stages of development, well before the final approval look for the cartoon version of Godzilla had been decided. The company had produced promotional artwork, character designs, and also resin and plastic prototypes for several of the characters. The first action figure assortment would include Godzilla, Crustaceous Rex, The Yeti, Nick Totopoulos, Randy Hernandez, and Nigel. One of the first toys planned for the Godzilla series line was actually a revamp of an existing Godzilla figure. Designed by Bill Bronson, the Ultimate Godzilla was a massive figure standing over a foot tall and more than two feet in length. Toho used the toy like a maquette, scanning it for the CGI model of the monster Zilla that appeared in the 50th anniversary Godzilla movie, Godzilla Final Wars. Wow, those look amazing! Where can I get some of those? I am truly sorry to disappoint you, Matt, but you can't. The movie line brought millions in revenue to Trendmasters. But all the retailers were left with too much stock on the shelves. So when the time came to pitch the animated line, Walmart made the harsh decision of a big fat no. They apparently hold the big hand on decisions of what gets made and if they will carry it in their stores or not. The initial retail orders for the toys proved too low for a wide release, the company canceled the launch and considered other options. At one point, Trendmasters planned on producing limited numbers of the figures and selling them online exclusively through the company's website. But they soon abandoned those plans and these amazing toys never saw the light of day. During the second season, the show fell in the middle of the battle between two other giants, Pokemon and Digimon. WB's acquisition of the anime Pokemon had proved a boom for the network and led to them consistently outperforming Fox in the ratings. To combat this, Fox acquired the similar show, Digimon Digital Monsters and Monster Rancher, and would air it in mini marathons, forcing Godzilla to be moved about the schedule or not shown at all. After a break of a couple months though, Godzilla came back with a vengeance. And according to Patton, the episode that relaunched the series, Freak Show, became the highest rated episode of the entire series. While this was a testament to Godzilla's drawing power, the long downtime meant that the show would finish its second and final season with two episodes still unaired. Despite the fact that it maintained high ratings with all the constant changes, Fox opted not to order additional episodes, and the series ran its course. There were discussions about doing a sequel series in conjunction with the second Godzilla movie, but that is a moot point since TriStar eventually decided to not do Godzilla 2 and no longer has the rights to make a new Godzilla film. And even if the sequel had been made, it would have needed to be a monster hit to justify another animated show. Now, Matt, before we wrap things up here, why don't you let the nice folks know where they can find you online? Well, you guys can find me over at mattfrankart.net. You can also find me on my Patreon over at patreon.com slash mattfrankart. And on Twitter, they call me spankzilla85. There is a whole story behind that, but I'm not going into it today. We cannot thank you enough for being a part of the video, Matt. But before we go, I gotta ask if you think this series is worthy of the name Godzilla. You know what? Yeah, I think it does. <laughs> Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, guys, guys. That was actually Matt Frank? I, I thought it was an impersonator. Oh, geez, this is bad. I, I get easily starstruck. When I, when I get starstruck, I start flubbing my words. Uh, anyway, be sure to smash the description below, comment the likes, subscribe to our bell. Oh, God, just play possum, Greeks. Stay awesome, geeks. What is wrong with me? <laughs>